Um, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for queuing that up, Roche. Um, so everybody, really excited about this discussion. Um, welcome to this edition of the Say It Loud panel series, um, where we're going to talk about Architecture Plus. Uh, this series is hosted by um, NC Noma, AIA North Carolina, and AIA Triangle Women in Architecture. We are excited to present an, enga an engaging discussion with these North Carolina designers as they share their contributions to the built environment. Meeting these designers has inspired me to deeply engage um, my passion in the work that I do and my engagement in the community. Each of these women adds a unique personal plus to their practice of architecture. Join us now in welcoming our panelists. To begin, Sivali Sazane is an interior design, um, designer with Gresham Smith's corporate and urban design market, creating tailored workplace solutions to match clients' needs and more, with more than 13 years of design experience. Her strength lies in her ability to build relationships with clients and to ensure a seamless design process. Some of her project highlights include Continental Tires Second Headquarters, Hodges Taylor Art Gallery, and numerous Horn USA projects. Civili is an active member in Crew Charlotte as well as Cornet. S.B. Harper is a specialized expert in healthcare planning and design. A Six Sigma green belt with a Master's of Architecture from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. SB excels at design research, data analyst, lean design principles, and design thinking to create leading edge healing environments. She uses strategic insight in functional programming, facilities right sizing, flexibility, and master planning. She is a frequent presenter on patient-centered design at national conferences. And I will take it from here um, and introduce the remainder of our panelists as well as our wonderful moderator. Um, so I will start with uh, Alicia Hilton Daniel. Uh, Alicia was a commercial interior designer for 10 years when she decided to open her own design build firm in 2018. She became a licensed general contractor following the purchase of an abandoned lot in Durham, North Carolina. Alicia designed and built her first modern house called Modernist One in 2017 and would go on to design and build Modernist Two and Modernist Three. As a design builder, she also takes on mid to large size client renovations, ranging from historic to mid-century modern homes. Welcome, Alicia. Um, and then we have Kimberly Mobley. Uh, Kimberly is uh, 25 years of experience has led her uh, has led to her passion for educational facilities and an authentic love for design and architecture. It has created a platform for consulting, mentoring, and advocating for the next generation. With a BS in design from Clemson University and a BARC from UNCC, fellow alumni, go, go Kimberly. Uh, Kimberly was named one of Charlotte's 50 most influential women by Mecklenburg Times in 2020. She is the co-chair of the Student Outreach Committee with Crew Charlotte and regularly presents at events to engage the next generation. Welcome, Kimberly. And certainly that last but not least, um, I was actually in school with Janine Chastain, so I'm excited to do her introduction. Um, Janine is a business strategy consultant trained in architecture and business management with expertise in marketing, communications, and leadership development. She founded Apostrophe Consulting with the goal of helping architecture firms win more work, build a culture of leadership and trust within the design studio, and create a pipeline for emerging leaders to grow in our industry. She is co-host of the Practice of Architecture podcast, Practice Disrupted. Janine has spoken across the country on leadership development, career advancement, emerging professionals, mentorship, and women in architecture. Welcome. Thank you all for uh, being with us today. With that, I am going to turn it over to our moderator, Janine Chastain. 
Thank you so much for Shay. And I'm just scrolling down the list of attendees and I see so many familiar faces. We're really glad to have you here today. Um, our very distinct group of panelists have amazing stories to share. And so we thought that the best way to start this discussion to celebrate their unique contributions to the field of architecture is to uh, ask them to tell a story about their experience. The theme of this discussion is really about their architecture and their plus. So looking at different things that they're pairing with architecture and design and the built environment to enhance the work that they're doing. Um, so each panelist is gonna share a short story and then we'll move into the Q&A discussion. So I'm gonna ask SB to start us off. Thanks, uh, Janine. So, uh, Starting back with my story, you know, I wanted to be a doctor and um, let's just say first semester undergrad, second semester undergrad proved that that wasn't going to be the <laughs> route for me. And I ended up um, getting into design and art history and that's kind of how my, my entrance began into architecture. Um, but once there, it kind of came full circle and I started doing something called healthcare planning. Um, a gentleman was my mentor and I love the fact that he was getting out of the office and he was going and interviewing nurses and physicians to get information for the design. And I was like, bring me along. Um, and it was fascinating. And so that led to uh, a substantial career in doing healthcare design. And right around um, maybe the mid 2000s is when I started dabbling in things like design research and, and data. And so right around that time, um, the industry came out with the evidence-based design accreditation and certification. And it was something that was really intriguing to me. It was really starting to propose a way to ask the question, is the why due to design and really backing it up with some research and numbers and, and qualitative information. And so that's kind of how I got my plus. Um, one of my first um, experiences was going on site to an emergency department and I was doing a behavioral observation with an iPad tool. And, uh, it, you know, we design these spaces, but we don't really get to live in them unless we have an event of our own. And um, I remember standing there and they were doing something very simple, like drawing blood um, from a gentleman and he was with his daughter. Uh, they were not English speakers. The father um, was feeling queasy and uh, passed out. And at the same time, a couple of um, stab victims came into the ED. And so as I'm trying to document what's happening, you know, it was one of those really eye-opening experiences to say, this is how this wall in our ED is impacting the ability of these nurses to serve these two extreme uh, situations at the same time. And that's really what kind of fueled my passion. Great. We're gonna to go to Alicia next. Okay. Um, hi everyone. Um, so I found my plus by, by accident. Um, first of all, I became an interior designer when I was in my early 30s because I had a house fire. And following that, um, I was navigating the world of being a grossly underpaid interior designer. And I purchased a property with my husband with the intentions of rehabbing it to become a rental property. I hired a bad general contractor who took advantage of me being a woman and assumed I did not know construction. <laughs> Boy, did he underestimate me. Not only my understanding of construction, but my determination to prevail and get justice. As a black woman, we are constantly and, un and unconsciously having to self-advocate. Anyway, um, it was my husband that planted the seed. It was not something I even imagined was possible. It was for me out of context, right? Like you don't see a lot of black women claiming to be general contractors. As women, especially black women, we were put in a very in a very limiting box by society, and in many cases by our, ourselves as well. When my husband suggested it, it made total sense. It continued to make sense ever since. I love it most days, and I'm great, and I'm great at it. Um, it's empowering to be able to build what I design. 
Great, thanks, Alicia. And Kimberly, I'm gonna head to you next. Wow, okay. Um, I love that everybody has a story. And if, if you take nothing away from today, realize that everybody has a story. Listeners, please take that from me, okay? Um, I am coming in, I have to give some credence to those on my path here. So Brownstone Construction, uh, they've given me an opportunity to have this opportunity to speak with you actually. Um, uh, from the ground up 15 years, they built a construction management firm and then they had the vision to include in their till box design. So they've, they've had a vision to expand their construction management uh, repertoire with the design division and that's my part of the team and they are actually in the process of leading the construction of the International African American Museum in Charleston right now um, which is soon to be one of the national icons uh, that we're very proud to be part of so congratulations Brownstone but my first 25 years was with Gantt Huber Architects with Harvey Gantt um, you all may know of him. Uh, he has been my personal friend and mentor for like 22 years. I'm like, Harvey, I gave you the best years of my life. You understand that, don't you? <laughs> but he really took the time to nurture and, and pour into me and us on the team uh, to the extent that I was able to look back and reflect on this my relationship with the firm and experiences I had with him and opportunities he had for me to um, design and construct K-12 uh, projects, it became my plus. It became something that I have to have a constant connection to. I've spent a lot of times recreating those trying to recreate those experiences is about three years of back to back to back. I just had one school after the other to take from A to Z, but he was able to introduce me to school districts where the, the students and the kids were of modest means, of course, um, some more than others, but one in particular in Charleston, uh, there's, a, there's a school called Sanders Clyde right now. At the time it was a K-8 situation, but it was located in the heart of a, pro, a project, housing project development right across the street from the intercoastal waterway. And at, at high tide, the water would just come across the street and just flood the school out. You know, it just, it was a way of life. You go, you go in Friday, you come back Monday with the soot and the dirt and all that, everything that's left behind from the flood coming in. So here you are, a kindergartner, you can't wait to get to school. You want to be a teacher's pet, but all of a sudden your task is to help the teacher get the, the surge protectors off the floor on Friday, lift them up high so that you can't, you know, there's no problems. You want to go to the library to finally serve yourself a book, but all the books have to be up higher because they anticipate the damage of the Lord. You know, those kind of things that you you're all excited about as a kid, you just can't do because of you have to live in the stench and the mildew and the heat. And so um, the supporters got together to do something about it. And we were able to take a design concept that was able to come up with, got the support for it. And we were able to raise that finished floor like eight to nine feet. I mean, it's an unconscionable amount of piles involved, but nine feet up, we could elevate this, it becomes rampalicious because now you can't get anybody off the street, right? But we elevated that school up to, it's like an oasis in the middle of the housing project now. And so then you can get the free flow and the, the single loaded corridors and, and have some promise. And I got to see the impact of the profession. I could read a book every week to a child, which is very important work. But I can also make a lasting impact if I use the profession properly to, to go to nurture to that end. And I've just found that it, in my quest to recreate a situation that way, just the influence of being able to have a seat at the table for items and issues and community meetings that I care about to this end, the influence that I have as an architect is what the platform is I'm finding to be the most useful for like now. And so it keeps me current on the, even on a volunteer basis 
have that consistency con in contact with the next gen uh, through those means, influence and volunteerism. Thank you, Kimberly. That was a really wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we're going to go next to Civili. Yeah. Um, thank you. So I have been interior designing for 13 years now. Of that 13 years, 10 years was uh, predominantly uh, just interior design and, um, and about three years now as a business development and interior design. So my plus is photography. I got into it when I was pregnant with my daughter who is five years old now. And what was, you know, supposed to be just something to document her growth. Um, my designer in me kicked in when I was trying to do a book and I hated all of the smartphone photos and preferred the camera quality. Um, so I kind of started getting really into it and, you know, started challenging myself with lighting and, um, um, you know, the, the portrait and everything, just all the aspects of photography trying to really improve. And I got pretty good, I would say. Um, and then started, you know, pulling people to be my models. And really that ended up being a, a business. So I got an LLC and made that into a business. And it, it's kind of funny because from a design standpoint, the photography hasn't impacted the design, but it has impacted my personal growth. Um, you know, I didn't think I was going to be going into business development. And it's funny because a colleague will call myself a reclusive extrovert. I am extrovert in nature when talking one on one. However, in a big public group, I'm extremely private. So getting out of my shell was very hard. Um, but when you start a photography business, it's about, you know, three or four percent actually taking a photo. And then the rest is the business and the editing. Um, and so it teaches yourself, you know, in this flooded market, because tutorials are very much available, how do you set yourself apart from everybody else? And you, you quickly learn in terms of being strategic, um, you know, what is it that's different? Because you can have somebody with the same fees, the same, you know, the same style, but it's yourself, you know, creating experience and um, showing your authentic self and making that the differentiator. Um, so really what it has done for me, it, it helped me get out of my shell, uh, my, my comfort zone, helped me get out and approach people. Um, so it really helped mesh well um, with the, the career path that I was going that I didn't know I was gonna go into. So that would be uh, the biggest thing. And also from um, a strategic standpoint, just being very cautious on how you want to take each step um, and that also relays a lot to the business development side. Great, thank you. So you can start to see through these stories that each of our panelists have a unique perspective about the way that they're viewing their work. We're gonna move into the Q&A. So I'm gonna to start to ask them questions. And if you have questions, you can provide them in the uh, chat box or in the um, Q&A section, and we will moderate those as we go. So Espy, I'm gonna come back to you. In our um, planning call, you talked a lot about your curiosity curiosity and that kind of curiosity driving you towards this um, discovery of your love for data and merging it with design and new processes. Can you talk a little bit about where you look for inspiration and how you find these new ideas? Sure. So, um, you know, a lot of people say, like, don't mi mix uh, church and state, but <laughs> I mix my faith and what I do for a living all the time. So I pray and I really do ask the Holy Spirit to give me some great ideas. And sometimes that works in the middle of the night, um, especially when I'm really like struggling. Uh, so that's the main source of my inspiration. I think it also comes from just loving to be, um, again, that curiosity, loving to be well-rounded. I love listening to podcasts. I love listening to music. I love thinking about what we do as designers or the design practice and, and how that might relate to, say, um, software engineers or software architects and, and this whole discussion around um, agile and sprints. I'm like, could we do a sprint? Maybe we could do a sprint. Um, and so th these are the kinds of things that I'm always sort of dabbling in and scrolling through. Um, but I think really the biggest 
um, part of the, the inspiration and new ideas is really tapping into a, so far it's been a network of women. Um, I had the opportunity to participate in a group called Goal Friends. And this was a sort of multidisciplinary group of women who just wanted a support um, group around achieving goals. Um, so we've, we've got a, a therapist turned CEO. We have a teacher who's writing a book on divorce with her son. And we have a, a pharmacist who also does Reiki healing. And, and so it just runs the gamut and, you know, an, an architect. Um, and so we really just support each other. We, we give each other space to brag. We give each other um, space to throw the idea out there and then have eight or nine cheerleaders. Um, and then there's just my work support group. Um, Megan Bowles is one of them, um, Julia Bedoric. Uh, I could go on and on, Kelly Monroe. These are people that I just have coffee with and, and, and get the ideas out there. They give me feedback. I tweak it, I come back, and, and that's really the inspiration that keeps me fueled. Fantastic. Alicia, um, I want to talk a lot about your dual role that you mentioned you play in both being a designer and um, a contractor and, and the identity that that infuses in your work. Um, so how do you see your plus impacting the future of our profession in terms of these dual roles that you're playing? So um, clearly I wear both hats and it has its, it has its, um, its advantages and, and some days it, it has its, its disadvantages, but I think as it relates to general contractor and tangible hands-on work, um, I'd love to see more women, um, especially women of color pursuing these opportunities. Um, having boots on the ground and hands-on experience just makes you better at the design process. Um, you get to see and learn it from the build perspective, which ultimately makes you a better designer. Um, as women, we are inherently more detail-driven. We tend to be more empathetic, which is impactful in how we build and the efficiency in this industry continues to lack. Um, construction falls I think people don't understand, but construction actually falls behind healthcare, right? So <laughs> um, the industry, it's pretty bad and it's worse right now because we're dealing with supply, demand, um, you know, post the post-pandemic -pan issues. And so just, it can just be a miserable um, field to be in when, you know, the design part of it has been executed and you're still trying to get, you know, construction off, off the, the uh, the ground right now. So anyway, um, construction falls behind healthcare, as I said, and it is due to the low numbers of women in this field. In short, the future the future is is female. Um, to piggyback on um, what SB had said when we were planning, it's about dis disrupting norm, right? The normal traditional way that things are being done, um, and societies um, the. And for us to be limiting on society's gender and race applied to, to roles of us. Um, I have never been so much more sure of myself since adding my plus as a general contractor. Um, do I know everything? Heck no. <laughs> but who, who, who does know everything, right? I think that there is this kind of expectation of women having to know everything and who's who's given grace and who isn't given grace. And um, we are always given grace to men, especially white men, but not giving any grace or demanding grace to ourselves. Um, and I just think that we just need to self advocate. Um, and it totally sucks that we must constantly do this, but until we do this, until we continue to do this, until it becomes normal. Um, and maybe it won't happen in my lifetime, but I won't stop fighting until we are actually there. So I'm just hoping that I influence more women to understand or just to kind of see it from both perspectives and how um, empowering <laughs> from just the aspect of, you know, bringing something from the design to fruition um, from all aspects, but more, more so the empowerment that it has, but the um, the um, the value, the 
that it also offers. Thank you. I, you know, and I have to say that as a business owner, I'm looking at you and imagining just how many women are looking up to you as a role model in these dual leadership roles. So uh, kudos to you for stepping into that role and responsibility that you're leading the way. Civil, <laughs> um, I wanted to also ask you the, a similar question. Um, I know that you spoke in the planning call about how important finding photography was for you in terms of sparking that creative outlet for you, even in your own professional work. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how photography, your plus, uh, could impact the future of the profession? Sure. I mean, I think in general, everyone should have a plus. Um, you know, it's very easy to get burnt out uh, although, you know, the corporate world is in comparison, let's say to healthcare where the project is a much longer, you know, span, um, corporate is pretty quick and you're, you're turning a lot of it, right. And you're reacting, um, and it can easily get you burnt out. And I, sometimes I think you need that little break, uh, something that you enjoy, um, or maybe not enjoy, but in any case, I enjoy it. Um, something on the side that just gets you energized, gives you a break, just brings some of that creativity back into what you're doing. Um, you know, it's, it's something that you're, cho you're choosing to do. Um, and if, if you're passionate about it, it, it doesn't kind of go away. I mean, I will say for what I had learned initially with uh, photography, it was um, learning to balance because it quickly went from doing one session a weekend to maybe two and then it was like non-stop and then you're editing and eventually I just stopped enjoying it so finding that balance um, knowing the boundaries of um, you know when to take some time for yourself I think you don't get that unless you have an additional plus with your career Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I think everyone should have a plus. Um, Kimberly, I want to come back to you. And a lot of your story, and especially in our planning conversation, is around this next generation and how important education is to you, both as a designer, but also in your volunteer work. So can you tell us a little bit more about your vision for the future and where you'd like to see the profession head? Yes, um, <clears throat> sure. My plus I'm thinking is me getting an alignment with what I think my purpose is. Uh, the road has been a little bit rough. I mean, to be one of the 500 registered African-American women, everybody has a story. It doesn't mean there's only 500 qualified women, but you can imagine that every one of us have been through some sort of fire, right, to get here. Uh, and so the fact that I've committed to God my husband and I think architecture, there's this consistency that I have, this, this burning desire to find a, a relevance for it in my life. And so as I reach out to the next gen, how I, I really wanna get that school built with the daylight out that I'm satisfied with, I want, I want them to be able to have a, a sense of awareness of place and how they have these, these uh, these incredible, amazing technical skills that they are developing. They're living in a time where we're the most sensitive and the most conscious about each other and how we live together. And I'm, I'm thinking how architecture just fits right in there in, in determining community growth, built buildings, design, context, influence of having to mesh all of that sensitivity together and work as a team together because over the years we've seen the architects work with the developers, you know, through imminent. I mean, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, where they uh, urban renewal and those other exercises where they, where we've had a lot of uh, gentrification and isolation. You know, they we had a hand in that creating this situation. So now that we have these urban issues where we really want to deal with all kinds of people we don't have that kind of representation at the table to come up with the design solutions, the who the people we're trying to serve. So I am hopeful that the next generation that's now kind of in this political climate as crazy as it is, and they have these, these skill sets that they will come together and coalesce around a, a movement that could be design oriented 
to really kind of take us, take us to the next level. And it could be a, a very powerful thing for them to really have a, a, a powerful stamp and influence on our lifestyle, our sense of life. Um, I have a 15 year old boy, so I'm, I'm kind of, you know, feeling this, I can see him in some sort of role in having um, his colleagues or his, his friends uh, take harness all of this. Um, since, you know, our generation going through high school, we kind of skip some of what they have to deal with today. If we didn't have to quite have to deal with some of the, the back and forth that we're dealing with now, but I'm hoping that they can make the most of it and lead the next chapters uh, through their, um, this technology and, and options that they have to kind of push that, push that next step. So I'm here to tell them to stay true to yourself, keep it focused, keep it moving, keep it righteous and work together. That's what my, you know, I'm trying to keep that alive and for them to protect that part of their life. Um, and if I'm an architect that I can be at the table to encourage that, that's what I believe the platform is for. So that's my plus. Thank you, Kimberly. This next series of questions is an open discussion for all the panelists. So feel free to jump in whoever feels inspired to do so. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take our first question from our audience. Uh, Jim Williams asks a really great question. Can you speak to the unique challenges as women that you face to stay in the profession and your plus Long term, and what you uh, what needs to change so you can continue to succeed, Alicia, jump right. in. So, um, <laughs> unique challenges as women. Well, um, we're in a profession that's primarily been male dominated, um, profession that's primarily been white male dominated, and if you're an interior designer. Um, you're in a profession in a profession that was always white women dominated, right? Like um, mm -hmm. when I was hired as an interior designer, I was the only black woman in my firm, and they always made me feel like they were doing me a favor. Like because they brought me on, I should be happy for that and go no further than that. Um, and so I was always very hesitant, always very stressed out when needing to ask for a a, a raise. Um, I never questioned when they put me on projects that I know I just didn't fit with culturally. Um, so that was one huge challenge. <laughs> um, fast forward to coming to becoming a general contractor um, in a very male dominated, a very white male dominated world where I've shown up to the job site um, and clearly been identified as a general the general contractor. And that, that subcontractor will look through me at my husband and talk to him about the issues or the design, or you always get the word amazing. People love to use that word a lot. And I think they mean it in the most honest way to, to uh, compliment you when they're like, oh, you're, you're amazing. Well, what's amazing? Um, the only thing that's amazing is that we've kind of, as um, Kimberly said, there was, there's this fire that we had to get through and some of us are still caught up in that fire or can't get, get through it. Um, we just simply, and in any way, I don't mean simply, that's the wrong choice of words, but we have um, persisted. Um, we are in this profession against all of the barriers <laughs> that's been put up against us to keep us out. For me, um, you know, in terms of what needs to, what needs to change for me to succeed, I'm just going to come straight out and say it's money. It's having access. It's having the same resources. If I'm bringing the same talent or more or more talent to this table, I should be paid accordingly. There's also this notion of people always asking women, especially women of color, to do pro bono or free work. And I always say if I'm last on the totem pole in terms of a pay grade, I should be the very last person that you should be asking for free for free work, unless I choose to do free work. It's not for you to bestow that upon me. It is for me to let you know if I decide to open a nonprofit. So in order for us to succeed in this industry, there needs to be honesty. We need to be having a conversation on those on, on that we don't have access, we don't have resources, no matter if we have the same or more talent than other than our than our male counter counterparts. 
So that's pretty much it. So well said and, <laughs> you know, amen to that. I'm going to add um, for the women in the audience it's really, there's really power in numbers. And if, if you're not going to be an ally as a female, you make this even more challenging. Um, I think in, in a, if I look back over time and the situations that I've been in and where I've worked, um, some of the most supportive people were males. In fact, they were white males. Um, and women sometimes to each other can really, um, because of the challenges that we're all facing individually, it, you know, again, to, to, to Alicia's so well coined phrase of out of context, you know, you're female, you may be married and have a family, you may be African American or a person of color, and you start adding all of that and the pressure surmounts to um, sort of fall into the rut of, well, I'm just gonna try to move myself ahead. But there really is power in numbers. And I think that if women start looking at it that way, um, we'll start to see a trend where we can start to elevate each, each other and really kind of overcome what has been the challenge of unconscious bias. And if we're right, they're supporting one another. Amen. Amen, Epsi and Alicia. Okay. So that has inspired me to say a word or two about women and our, our perseverance. That's the other thing I want the next generation to understand. Everything that's worth having, you have to persevere on some level for it. Um, but when I speak with my crew ladies, um, I try to impart this one story because when we had this, this big civil unrest about uh, affirmative action, right? The beneficiaries of it primarily were white women. I mean, we don't talk about that part of it, but that really is what the statistics, statistics show. And the folks who are a vehement, vehemently, a vehemently, a, I can't get the word out. The people who are opposed to it typically are white women as well. So what I try to explain to my colleagues is that we all want the same thing. Really what you wanna do is think of it as us broadening the team. You know, if you have, if you can benefit from the efforts of civil rights, why not contribute to it? Because the windfall is in your favor anyway. I mean, there's a story that not many of us know about how Marilyn Monroe would not play at a venue unless Ella Fitzgerald was able, able to perform first. You know, you don't hear about those kind of stories, but it doesn't take away from the iconic nature of Marilyn and Ella Fitzgerald. She was able to have a legendary uh, legend. I mean, the, the gift of her voice. So it was, it's a matter of understanding that there's enough to go around. You know, if we have to coexist in this fight. Think of it as an expanded team. We're all going towards the same end. And I think if we can kind of put that in perspective and it, it simplifies what really is necessary to go forward. Everybody, it's enough. It's enough love to go around everybody, all right? And if we can start to get the dollars to flow equally, then, uh, then let it be. But just that mindset of understanding that it's, no one's taking away from you to help someone else. You know, that really does not diminish your chances. So that's, that's really what I wanna to try to make the, the younger folks learn while we, I catch up some of the old heads to kind of get that in their mind too. Well, I, I just wanna to add two more points because you guys have said, I think pretty much all of it. Um, but I would say the, you know, one of the biggest challenge for any female would be um, imposter syndrome. You know, we constantly, constantly talk ourselves down as if anything we do is just not worth mentioning. Um, and it's something that I personally struggle as well, you know, with the whole being extroverted slash introverted, you know, when, when there is something to be worth recognized, part of me is like, no, I don't really want to say that, you know, cause you just feel like you, you shouldn't or however, but you should, you should shout out to the world. Um, and I think one of the biggest thing in our, um, our panel rehearsal was, you know, the mention of representation. I mean, representing women, representing, 
you know, ourselves and um, our nationality and because this is the next generations that's going to be looking up. But then that also brings the important part of having more women in leadership. That is so important. I mean, the company that you're looking for, you know, seeing that female leadership is it's going to play a role in in selecting, especially now with, you know, the fight for talent. Um, so I think the more that we, you know, have in numbers and really support each other and, you know, speak highly of each other and have more leadership, then that's going to make a, a big change. Yeah. I'd also just like to add one more thing, because I think we need to also discuss failure, right? Like who's allowed to fail? Because failure is the mother to success, right? But in order to learn, you have to fail. So mm -hmm. you need permission to fail because mm -hmm. as a black woman, I'm not allowed to fail. I'm not allowed to learn as I go um, where white men are or people that are non-black are. And so having that conversation is also Im imperative to what we need to succeed. We have to be able to give ourselves the permission to fail and to have the support and be given the same, it all goes back to this word grace, be given the same grace as everyone else, because oftentimes we are not, we're afraid to fail because we'll get fired, we'll get de demoted, There's, they'll, that's, the, that's the reason why they can't pay us more, that's the reason that we can't have that same access or those, that same resources, but you do not ever hear men, especially white men, apologizing for failure, so. Thank you so much, panelists, for sharing your honest opinions. I do want to come back to something that we talked about in our planning call, just so you have a chance to share that great insight with our audience. Identity was a big topic that we discussed on the second half of the planning call, including multiple um, intersections of identity, be it um, young, female, Black, Asian, um, or perceived as young. Um, and we even have people on this call whose names are frequently mispronounced. Um, I agree with the comments of the panelists that every day as a, as a female leader, it takes determination and grit to get up and show up as your best self and keep pushing forward in your career. Um, but one thing that you all mentioned to me that I thought was insightful is this idea of feeling out of context in your career or in a profession or even in your firm. And um, Alicia, you were the one who kind of set this conversation up. Do you mind starting and sharing your thoughts on what out of context means? Sure. Um, well, first off, out of context means um, that you don't fit the traditional standard, right? Like um, of that role, based on gender, race, or, or both factors. Um, it then becomes the barring of such a person from having access to this particular industry, specifically playing um, a high role in that industry, one in which you are the influencer or you gain the most profit. So it's kind of that way of keeping us out. It further involves ensuring that if and when that person gets into the, the industry, that the ability to get resources will become more difficult, limited, and almost impossible in an effort to persuade that person to get out. So that's kind of what being out of context is. And I deal with that, like it's not, you know, I'm not saying, gosh, every day I'm struggling with this, but it's always there, right? It's always there in, in some form. Um, it's always there if, you know, I, you know, didn't hear about this, this lot, if I didn't get access to this grant or hear about this loan or no, you know, and also in like sub subcontractors or just finding out about things at the same pace as, as others that don't look like me in this industry. It's pretty much what being out of context is. <laughs> So I want to offer if anyone wants to add to that, but maybe we can um, the next phase of this discussion, talk about solutions and ideas that have helped you overcome that feeling of out of context things that people did for you or you saw modeled that were really fantastic. I feel like my plus. Um, helped a little bit with the with the out of context, you know, I started trying to leverage other things that I knew that I could differentiate myself, excel at, 
Um, and then also was just passionate ab about. So, so I'll give you an example of my non-traditional out of context self. I've been practicing for uh, 21 years and I am not a licensed architect. Um, I really dove into the planning aspect and really just kind of stayed there, loved it, really specialized, hyper-specialized, if you will, again, because I was always interested in medicine. Um, and then started to look for other avenues that really spoke to the client in. So that's how the Six Sigma uh, Green Belt certification came along because I was really interested in process improvement for the client because process really drives form in healthcare architecture. And um, things like, you know, um, data dabbling, you know, in, in, in 2013 was when I really started experimenting with software as a, to try to find a solution for easily capturing room data. Um, Cause I was doing all that in an Excel spreadsheet and that's really for an accountant, not for design information. And so, but it, it took a long time to, before that's even come to the forefront of, of practice today. Um, so maybe, I don't know, maybe I was ahead of my time, but I really started to just leverage that and say, you know what, I don't have to be what people define as a designer. And, you know, people have struggled with what, what to call my title. And I was like, well, let's just make it up each year. Like we can put something <laughs> different on the, on the business card each year. You know, it, it, now, now I'm at a point where I'm comfortable enough in my expertise that it's like, I mean, I, I've been called engagement leader. I've been called project planner, medical planner, healthcare planner. And I love it. I love the diversity because it gives me an outlet for the things that I'm passionate about. So I think you can leverage it as a differentiator um, and you can be comfortable, it, you know, to, to Kimberly's point, in, anything that's worth doing, you, you do have to persevere. So you're going to have to persevere. I'm not, don't, don't think you're going to graduate from school and automatically give yourself a title. That's probably not going to happen. You're going to have to put in some, some time um, and really hone your craft. But when you do, um, really start to use it. Um, if, if I can weigh in on that, because I found myself um, actually, because everything you, you've said, especially, you know, Alicia, I know in the real world, that is how it is. Um, so if you find yourself in a situation where you're not necessarily isolated in terms of your race and gender, you have people just like you around you, but you still don't quite fit, you know, I, I think a lot of that can be mitigated by getting real with yourself. I mean, we go through life, especially in the architectural and design profession, uh, having to seek approval for ideas and whatever constructive criticism we can get, um, we live for it. And you know, it's a personal thing to put your vision on the line because it's a personal part of you. And if you're not strong in the individual I know myself, you can take that as a personal construction or destructive Did we lose her? Uh oh, oh no, she froze. Yeah, she thought. She was making such a good point. I know. <laughs> I mean, I seriously relate to that so much. That's a little. Oh, there you are, Kimberly. You might have to pick up on your comment. Um, oh. When someone's giving you constructive feedback, can you run with that idea one more time? Yes, yes. The sense, your sense of self where you can distinguish uh, the constructive from the non-constructive comments. Um, and if you could, if you can imagine you go through the, the design school where you're looking for the thumbs up constantly, all the while you're putting yourself at literally on the line, um, your ideas, your, you know, things that come from your, your brain, your brain, your heart, and you're putting it out there for somebody to say it's worth considering, um, you have to have some perspective on how you deal with the response of that. And that, that translates into the professional world where you, you have, you may have to just understand who you are not, you know, you just may have to be clear on that, but that sense of self, and it's something that it takes a while if you're not there although already, that authenticity needs to be a goal set for everyone 
to try to get to that point where you can, you know who you are, you know whose you are, you know all of, you have that sense of grounding so that you can deflect what doesn't really belong and serve your purpose. Um, and, and through excellence of how you're, how you can really squash a lot of that is what I've had to do is just kind of perform exceptionally, which, you know, everybody, you know, you always have to be the best or whatever. Harvey was gracious to say, you know, Kim, that's why they call it the practice of architecture. So that had, that has given me an out every now and then of uh, the practice, the practice, but really it's that sense of self, you know, that authenticity, that if I were the, at the next generation to realize that it was something to protect along the way, because you can have you challenges you, life challenges that it eats at you, you fall in love, you fall out of love, you whatever, whatever, and it just it kind of could chip away at it. But you need to make a concerted effort to protect it, and that's what's going to carry some of these some of these things that we have to to just just maintain ourselves through. I, I would completely agree with you, Kimberly. I think that was very well said. Um, I mean, in my experience, what what typically gets out of context is um, I am Asian and we tend to age slow initially. Um, and then, you know, it, that, well, that's a stereotype. But, you know, for me, it was the perception that I just was right out of high school and I, you know, started my career. That's what I looked like and people equate, you know, age with experience. Um, but it's absolutely correct. I mean, the more time that you work in the career, you you know who you are. Um, and typically upon just you know visibly meeting somebody, it typically goes away after speaking. So I think it's very important to feel comfortable with who you are, know what you are, and not um, quickly assume, from my experience that, you know, or be in my head that what I say, may not come out the way because I'm thinking too much like they don't understand me because they think you know I'm I don't know what I'm talking about but that's not the case you know and how you assert yourself is it definitely shows um with time yeah I love this conversation and I just want to throw in the idea that communication um you know often we communicate and maybe we have intentions but we don't explain our intentions so often with a culture of criticism which is heavy in architecture things can be misunderstood and especially for young designers entering the field I know early on in my own career mm -hmm. I was devastated sometimes and it's really hard to understand at points in your career that criticism doesn't mean that you are a failure. Mm -hmm. And so we have to teach that when we mentor people, it's a really important thing to separate, you know, um, the personal and the professional feedback. Um, I, we only have time for one last question. So this question is for all of our panelists. What advice would you give to someone who has an emerging passion parallel to architecture? Just Go. do it. <laughs> yeah, who wants to jump in first? <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. Everyone loves a well-rounded person. Not that you're going for everybody's love, but think about how rich your life can be. It doesn't have to be any a professional plus. It could be, okay, Taekwondo is something that I've, my family has decided to commit to. Uh, and when I say the boys did well, they got their medals. You know, I'm still, I'm still working on it but it, I'm totally out of my comfort zone. It keeps me halfway in shape. You know, I, I lost some time with, with COVID, but it's something that it, it parallels my mindset professionally. It's like, I know I let this guy get away with whatever on the site because I don't have that one little bit of something that would let me just get with that opponent of mine on the mat. You know, what keeps me from just knocking that opponent just out of the box? what is that little bit of reserve that I have? Mm -hmm. Whatever that is, it's letting me let him get away with something that is not fair to me or my client or whatever. And it doesn't have to be a personal problem, but what that little bit of extra compassion that women actually have for each other. Um, sometimes you struggle to put yourself ahead of the other person when you need to put your head a, a you need to put yourself ahead, put yourself first so you can benefit your team. You know, you, you slap somebody or you'll hit somebody and then you rush to pick them up to make sure that they're okay, you know, that kind of thing, which is righteous, you know. But when it's, when it's time to 
uh, compete, you got to win it. You know, you have to win the project. There's, number two is good, but number one is the winner. You know, you have to be able to seize and finish to seize the opportunity. But what is it that keeps you from getting that last point? And so if you have a plus to challenge that, you know, that, that's how you can get it all to work together. You know, that's how I'm struggling with that. I, don't, I think it's hard to know where it's going to come into play and how it affects your life, but it does one way or the other. And I think you'll be very happy that you gave it a chance. And plus, comfortable is boring. Just do it, you know? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I was and to cool. piggyback back on to civilly, um, yeah, just, you know, get out of your comfort zone. Um, but most importantly, I think it's, it's um, also think about how you can take ownership for of it, of your plus, and maybe how you can start your own business and not have to always work for somebody. <laughs> how you can have it work for you. Because I can tell you right now, like it's hard owning my own business, but it is so empowering. I cannot imagine, imagine going back to work for anyone. Um, so figure out how you can make your plus either incorporated in design and architecture and then navigate it in a way that you can start your own company some someday and i'm always going to mention money make sure that people don't have you work for free because a lot of times people try to market and say oh you know i can you know help you launch your uh, company if you do this this and, and that for me and if it doesn't sound right don't do it do not compromise your self-worth for for anyone but go for it i love that <laughs> my, my advice is um, pick up a great book. It's uh, by Cal Newport called So So Good They Can't Ignore You. Um, and then I would say, you know, the plus is going to be the serendipity that you're looking for. Like I, I was listening to this podcast the other day, as a matter of fact, and, you know, you think it's luck, but it, you can use this as your serendipitous moment. And when you, and when you introduce yourself, you, you know, when people are like, well, what do you do? You can be like, well, I'm an architect who photographs babies on the side and <laughs> cooks, you know, and, and you start, when you do that, you make a connection mm -hmm. and that connection can either serve you in business or in personal life, or it, it, it it opens up an extra door um, for you in relationship. And I think those moments that, that seem like luck are serendipitous because you have this plus to talk about. So. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much to all the panelists. I know that um, it, there's probably a lot more discussion we could have. I encourage you all to reach out to our panelists, engage them. They have wonderful thoughts to share on all of this. And thank you for your time today. So I'm going to pass it back to Verche, who's going to close us out. Hey, um, I thank you all. I, I really can't thank you enough for the conversation that we just had the pleasure of witnessing. I'm sure we could extend this for another hour um, and keep everybody engaged, but I want to thank you all for participating today. Thank you for everybody that called in um, and staying tuned in with us the whole time. This was really wonderful. Um, please feel free to reach out to AIA North Carolina, NC NOMA, uh, AIA Triangle Women in Architecture Group. Let us know your feedback on this. Um, and in addition to following us on Say It Loud. Um, each one of these wonderful women that have talked today are exhibited in our virtual exhibit currently. So please check that out if you haven't already. Uh, go find out more information about them and about other wonderful people that we've exhibited through our Say It Loud efforts. Um, the last thing I'll say is that our exhibit, we are pulling it out into the world um, in the beginning of 2022. So it will be a physical exhibit launching across North Carolina. So stay tuned for more details on that. Again, uh, thank you all for your time today. Really appreciate it. Amazing, amazing conversation and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.